So really what I want to try and do in probably 20 minutes or so is to talk about what I think is a, is a neglected dimension of a neglected problem. The, um, we, it has been neglected up until in recent years, the issue of malnutrition or undernutrition. What I am going to focus on is undernutrition, recognising that clearly there's a major issue of overnutrition and that they're linked, so we do, but many of these issues are common to both dimensions of the problem, but the political dimension has been neglected a lot, and that's part of the reason why, until recently, there hasn't been enough traction and movement in, in terms of uh, generating commitment and turning that commitment into impact. So this is what I'm going to try and do in the next 20 minutes or so, talk about the nature of what exactly is the problem we're talking about, what causes some of these outcomes that we, we're aware of and the high levels and the fact that there's been quite a lot of inertia and not much has changed in recent years, why is this issue fundamentally political, what's actually happening and what's not happening. And I want to focus on two papers uh, that I've been involved in. The first one is on the issue around what we call enabling environments. Um, and I'll explain what, what that is. That was a paper that came out as paper four, and this was a joint collaboration with I, IDS and IFRI. Paper four of the Lancet series of last year, which you may, may have come across, and I do have some handouts, <coughs> one page is on that. The paper four looked at the issue of politics and nutrition. That was the first time the Lancet had ever dealt with that um, at all. They had a, an early series in 2008. The second paper there, um, it's just been submitted to the Lancet, and it's a review of scaling up nutrition, not the sum, this is lowercase, scaling up nutrition, the issue of how to generate large-scale impact on nutrition, what we know and what we learnt, or what maybe should we learn, from other disciplines outside of nutrition. And the big question is, where do we go from here? Now this is, so what's the problem? This is a, a map of where the problem is, uh, the two big high burden, I'll go quite quickly through this, uh, um, I assume you, a lot of this is known to you. Two big high burden regions being South Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa. There are 34 countries in which 90% of the problem of stunting, and we're looking at child stunting, that's under five kids who are just not reaching their genetic potential for height uh, for their age. And they're less than two standard deviations of what you would expect. Those are stunted kids, they're around 165 million globally. 40% of them are in India, in fact, or 30, at least a third of all stunted children reside in India. And then there's a large, as you can see from these, the red is anything over 40% at national level, although data are a bit um, patchy, and, and that's another part of the problem we have. That's the map of stunting. Now, what do we know about where the damage is done, or th where the window of risk or the window of opportunity lies? What this is, is just, I don't have many graphs like this, I can assure you. Um, this is child age along the bottom here. These are 54 countries using d demographic and health survey data, national level data. And so we have child's age up to age um, five years of age here in months, and we have Z score. Now what a Z score is simply a measure of uh, Stunting or underweight or wasting. And if this child was not, if you have kids in these populations growing at a normal rate, they would be all along this line. So the extent of drop off from the line shows the degree of damage or the degree of deficit and when it's occurring in a child's age. And you can see, and we're looking at stunting, we know for various reasons stunting is particularly important. It has major functional consequences for the child. He or she will, if she or he or she survives, be becoming stunted at, um, in childhood, be physically um, uh, compromised, be mentally uh, challenged. Cognitive links are very well understood now. Chances of earning a living later in life are much less. The chances of learning in school are much less, um, and there are multiple spin-off effects at the level of um, national, at the level of nation states. Now the drop-off, where you find most of the stunting actually occurring is in the first 24 months of life. But we, we also know about the 1,000 days. This, and the 1,000-day period is the period of nine months of pregnancy plus those two years of life. That is when most of the damage is done uh, among, among children uh, growing or not growing. And that represents the window of opportunity, because if we can act here and if we can turn this around or we can push this line further back up here, we have a major um, 
possibility to address this issue. So that's the focus in the life cycle. Not only that, but that primarily will be the focus of thousand days. This is a framework from the Lancet. This, in one slide, gives you the whole picture of what we know as the major drivers of undernutrition. I'm going to, um, before I mention that, I'm just going to mention the Lancet series itself and what's happened globally on on nutrition. Uh, the first Lancet series on malnutrition was in 2008, and in that series there was a paper that looked at the international nutrition system. It really was almost parentheses around that word system, and it was it was really scathing and, and basically said that there is no system. It, it's dysfunctional. It's fragmented. It's all over the place. There are lots of actors squabbling over whether nutrition is a food issue, whether it's a health issue. And it's in a mess, basically. That was 2008. The last four, uh, sorry, the last six years have seen a huge change in, in harmonization and consensus that's gener been generated around what is driving on the nutrition and the reality that all these things are important and we all have to work together. Uh, there are various things that have been driving this momentum. One is the sun scaling up nutrition movement. I would say it's driving the, the change. It's also been driven by the change, and that came up. Uh, that was launched, the Sun Movement was launched in 2010. There's a thousand days movement. Actually, another reason of the change, I think, was this food price spike in 2008, which really shone a spotlight on the issue of, of hunger. And nutritionists seized that uh, and, and started to talk about what was needed to turn that, that around. Donors now have the nutrition strategies, they've been major pledges, and the Nutrition for Growth event of last year generated. $23 billion worth of pledges, uh, $4 billion of which were for nutrition-specific or direct actions up here, and $23 billion were for what we call nutrition-sensitive. So there's a lot changing, and the big focus now, I think, is moving, is retaining and sustaining that momentum politically, but also turning the focus on implementation, which I'm going to come to. But just to let you know, just to point out what this really says, we, we have... The ultimate goal being optimum fetal and child nutrition development. Spinning off from that, there are a whole series of benefits that occur over different generations, not only for the same generation and not only for the same child. Below that, we have these, the immediate level drivers, and that relates to issues of feeding, <coughs> caregiving, and health-seeking or, or preventative health. Those are the, if you like, the practices, nutrition supporting uh, practices which support nutrition, good nutrition within the household. At the community or household level, there's food security, there is caring capacity, and there is access to a health service and safe environment. We know, and, and the Lancet talks about 13 interventions which are direct or nutrition specific, which impact or are designed to impact on this level of the problem, more immediate level, if you like. There is another paper, paper three of the Lancet of 2013, which really goes as far as possible to lay out the evidence for these wider sectoral actions. They're not just nutrition programs. They're agriculture, social safety nets, water sanitation, and um, early childhood development. They're, they're potentially very nutrition relevant. And they have, there is a potential to influence these programs and to turn them into nutrition, uh, positive programs for nutrition. What we do know, and this is slightly disturbing, is that even if you scale up this package of 13 interventions to 90% in most countries, we're only going to get about a quarter of the way we need to get, fifth or 20 25% of the way we need to get by doing this, which means there's an absolute imperative to deal with nutrition sensitivity. And what we say in paper four, so this is paper three, this is paper four, this is paper two, and this is paper one. What we say in paper four is we cannot do that without really understanding the political environment, what we call an enabling environment, which can be defined as a wider, the wider set of policy and political processes that are required to build the momentum politically, but crucially to turn that into effective actions to address undernutrition. And in our paper, we characterize that enabling environment based on work. We, we did a literature review of nutrition-relevant policy processes, and we show some of the key dimensions and, and uh, issues that need to be addressed to maximise, to strengthen that enabling environment. Because these two levels cannot work unless we have that. That is absolutely foundational, fundamental. 
it's also dynamic. It's not just locked in. It, it's changeable. Uh, we can influence it. We can do research on this. In the past, nutritionists have been quite naive in many ways, I think. They haven't addressed political issues as if that's something for someone else to do. So that black box of the political economy of, of undernutrition was just, just a black box. It was just left out there. And as long as we fed evidence into it, we would expect things would happen at the other side of it. That didn't happen. So now we see it as a researchable issue, and uh, that's part of one of the things that Paper 4 was intended to do. And to cut a very long story short, and to boil it down ridiculously, simplistically, into three core elements, um, which comes from this review of the policy literature and the policy process literature, not only in nutrition, but in other spheres that relate to nutrition, agriculture, social protection, etc., there are three core domains that we need to take, take into account. And the first is evidence, knowledge, but also, crucially, how that knowledge is framed and the narratives that go along with that or the stories that go along with that. The second is what we just titled as politics and governance. That's how do, that, that includes issues of horizontal coherence across sectors, how sectors talk to each other and collaborate, how the national level, policy level, interacts with the grassroots and vice versa, that's vertical coherence. This will also involve how the public and private come together for nutrition, issues of accountability, uh, which also links with data, which will be here. And then, obviously, there's a core issue around the issue of capacity, capacity to, to do anything, really, capacity to design programs, to implement programs, to do proper monitoring and evaluation, and so on, and underpinning all these financial resources, the funding to make this all happen and in a sustainable way, uh, with flexibility for, for adaptations along the way. Putting all this together, we can see yeah. from, from literature that you can get into and different uh, case studies that we've run generate significant impact. But what is really important also to know is that this is important, these three factors are important for generating political momentum, but they're also important for generating, um, for supporting implementation. And we'll come to that, those two sequential stages, although they should act in parallel, but they're, they're important for different reasons, which again we'll come to. Now if we just look at the evidence issue, um, the first of those bubbles, um, there are a whole set of stories around nutrition, and it, a, a, a sort of a nutrition champion or somebody who's advocating the cause of nutrition needs to understand which story or narrative may turn the key for nutrition in, in different contexts. There are many, and they're all mutually supportive. They're all available as a resource um, to, to use. Now, one would be that nutrition is important for national growth, economic growth. Uh, another is the idea of the supercharging of the demographic dividend, the increasing ratio of, of um, productive to non-productive members of society and, and populations. Uh, given what we know about how important nutrition is for their productivity, for their educability and their income in the future, by investing in, in children, uh, you're supercharging this debt dividend which, which has major potential for economic growth if we just look at that. Nourishing minds. We know about micronutrient deficiencies, iron, uh, iodine, the damage that does to children and obviously continuing throughout life. Uh, lower IQs, child survival, 45% uh, of all under child Sorry, 45% of all under five child mortality is directly or indirectly related to malnutrition. Hidden hunger, again, is around, about, around the, the micronutrient dimension, although I think a lot of hunger and un undernutrition is hidden or invisible in many ways, which is part of the problem. Stunting, stunted kids, and we were talking about this just over lunch. Because there are so many in a village or in a setting, they become normal. That's the new norm, and um, it's a real challenge to make the invisible visible. We're learning a lot more about preventing stunting as one way of preventing this wave of uh, non-communicable -communicable disease, obesity, diabetes, cancers, hypertension, heart, uh, heart disease later in life. So these are different narratives. Another I haven't even put here is a human rights narrative. There's a zero hunger. Uh, there are multiple, and they can be used, and it can need to be backed up with evidence using uh, current data. The second bubble I showed there was about, um, earlier on, was about the political and governance aspects. And this is, I think, the only second, second and last graph I've been showing, but this is just a tabulation of horizontal coordination 
against vertical. And what I mean by this, this is sectors, agriculture, social protection, health, for example. How coordinated are they? Are they actually talking together, uh, talking to each other about nutrition? Are they planning or are they taking joint integrated action or not? If, it's, if that's happening, it's high-level horizontal coordination. Vertical, and this is often neglected, we, we're doing more of a multi-sectoral, high-level talk here. But this is where it really matters. This vertical is from the national level down to the grassroots. Are those policies, plans, strategies actually being implemented? Are they understood throughout all levels, right away from national down district to grassroots level? So that's vertical coordination. Now, different countries have chosen different routes. The ultimate is to get both. You need good cross sectoral coordination, and I'm just realizing I'm blocking you from that. <laughs> um, and you need good cooperation between centre and local. That's where we want to aim, that's where countries really should aspire to, or anyone trying to deal with undernutrition. Now you get countries going this route. They get the horizontal right first, then they go into the vertical. Peru is one example of that. In Peru, um, there was a child nutrition initiative led by a coalition of NGOs, which extracted pledges from all presidential candidates in what was called a five by five by five. That's in five year period, uh, under five, um, stunting and under fires would be reduced by 5%. Those presidential candidates signed up to this, and Alan Garcia, who won that election, was held to account for that pledge, and the, the, a lot of high-level discussion was around nutrition in Peru at that time. Once that was off, you know, grounded, there was much more of a move to get, roll out uh, multi-sectoral programs within affected areas especially, so that was the first one. Um, Malawi also, a similar thing. Now, the, both Peru and Malawi have high-level ex- um, nutrition units linked to the Office of the Prime Minister, which makes a big difference. That, that's what we're seeing as well, and that's been shown in the work of the Sun Movement. So that's Peru and Malawi. Go that way, if you like. Another way is to go that way. In Maharashtra, in India, the Chief Minister of India could not believe, apparently just had a sort of total shock one morning, realising that 40% of all kids in this amazing economic success story were stunted and he didn't believe it and eventually he did believe it and said we've got to do something so he set up a state level nutrition mission and just said so well, what's the big nutrition program in India okay ICDS is the big program what's it doing and he, he basically shone a spotlight from the highest level on what ICDS was doing or not doing and there was a lot that it wasn't doing because it, they were just not even the right grass, sort of frontline workers weren't even in place they didn't have the appropriate skills, they weren't getting the right amount of training, they weren't getting the right amount of support, numerous things. So he said, I'm focusing on the 15 most disadvantaged tribal districts in Maharashtra, putting all the energy into those districts. And it was a huge difference. And just getting people in their jobs, supported, empowered to do what was always there on paper that they should do. That made a big difference. And then, again, that was rolled out, out beyond those 15 districts. But, you know, everything, nothing is as simple as that. There are many ways to get to that, that final top right uh, cell. Uh, the important thing is to get there. Leadership. Now we're going again, part of capacity and part of the politics is about leadership. Leadership is absolutely pivotal in everything to do with nutrition. And it's, we sort of hoped and assumed that leaders would emerge. And I think we need to do a lot more about building, I mean, creating and incentivizing and supporting leaders or champions. Um, in the work we do in Transform, we run a scheme called a Nutrition Champions, which whereby nominations come in and uh, through various processes we shortlist key s- stories of how individuals have operated in, this, in, in, in nutrition. They may be health workers at the community level, they may be national politicians. And it's, it's designed to inspire others in terms of understanding how individuals can operate in this space. One aspect of leadership, though, it's not all top-down. There's a lot of lateral leadership that's needed across sectors, and that involves, that requires an understanding of how to communicate, how to understand incentives, how to look for the win-win solutions that exist out there. Leadership is absolutely key, and we've done a study of leadership, um, which has just come. A paper's coming out in Food Policy in the next week, I think. Uh, that 89 leaders were interviewed about what was driving. Their, what, trying to understand what, why they became, or how they became leaders and that's quite in, instructive it really looks at their background 
the knowledge that they've gained, the types of knowledge and the skills that they've, they've developed in, in terms of political and, and communication skills, as well as the toolbox of nutrition. But if, if anything, it's more about those softer skills. Capacity, um, again, obviously fundamental, almost by nature. Um, this has been used in the health world. It's relevant to nutrition. We have three levels of capacity. Tools and skills relate to an individual, whether he or she has the right tools to do the job, whether he has the right skills. This is more mid-level uh, organizational staff and infrastructure. And then, again, at what we call a systemic level here, uh, it relates to, let's say, a national level, how uh, it relates very much to governance and governance structures, how different ministries uh, have forums uh, to communicate, to make decisions. I mean, the classic case in Sun Movement, the multi-stakeholder platforms, is part of systemic capacity, which is absolutely you know, fundamental for, for generating the buy-in and the connections that are required. Now, funding. Actually, in many cases, funding, funding is an issue. It's not necessarily the biggest issue. Um, this is a way of thinking about funds, resources, financial resources for nutrition. And you can cross-tabulate... Sorry, I said this is no more tables. This is another table. Uh, cross-tabulate public, <coughs> private only, and then the public-private in the middle. And looking at what donors might do and what high-burden countries themselves might do. And it's just a way of sort of being a bit more uh, sort of fine-grained about this discussion about resource mobilization for nutrition. Um, there are obviously increasing commitments from donors, creating incentives that leverage high burden uh, countries to, to invest in nutrition. If you look here at the public-private partnerships, you see things like fortification, logistics, local innovation, and so on. I, won't, I don't have time to go into too much detail with that, but that's a way of looking at l the need to look everywhere um, be guided by a plan, but with checks and balances, and as being key. Um, this is the final table of this paper, which simply shows that all these issues here, which are related to generating momentum, uh, can be boiled down into these three types of uh, domains here. And there are, similarly, the same framework is relevant for implementation but for different reasons, or for different issues apply in those cells at that level. And that, I, I can hand these out at the end, this, this table's on the reverse of that policy brief, um, which we found useful, and we've applied this subsequently in, in countries in uh, Eastern Africa and South Asia, and it's been quite useful. That's the first part of what I want to say. I'm going a bit slow. The second, I can go quicker on this, is a new paper that we are have just submitted to the Lancet and we felt that the issue of scaling up, a lot of people use these words, scaling up, scaling up, scaling up. Do, what do they mean? Do they all mean the same thing? What do we actually know about scaling up uh, nutrition impact? Is it, is it about making something bigger? Is it about generating wider impact and sustaining that impact? I mean, it, it really is about this, but it may require this making a program or a project bigger. But it's also about change. Uh, things may change and need to change and need to be adapted as they go from small scale to large scale. There's no reason why something that's successful at small scale is going to be automatically successful at large scale. You can see I'm a cyclist. But it's also about evolution. Things just, again, it links to the change. They, they will evolve and the actual nature of the program will, will need to change in most situations. Now, we, we've come up with, in this review, nine elements, which again, and this overlaps a little bit with what I was talking about earlier, uh, that are fundamentally important. But one of the, the first questions to ask, and this is, we define scaling up as generating large-scale impact. It is not about making a program bigger. It's not only about making a program bigger. It could be many programs. It's about sustaining those programs. So the first thing to think about is, what is the goal of our all these stakeholders talking about the same thing. Do they all want to go to the same place? Is the vision a shared vision? Um, and then how do you measure that? What, so what are the metrics for measuring that vision? Uh, without that, we don't have accountability. We don't know if we're getting there. Uh, we don't know. Uh, this, so that is, is key. And there's a very good publication coming out um, 
the health systems group in WHO called Beginning with the End in Mind. So the first question is not looking at the program and saying, how do we make this bigger, but f- figuring out where the vi- what the vision is, and then coming to the question of what is to be scaled to reach that end point or that vision. And yes, you may have a large-scale nutrition program in your, in your country, and that may only be covering a certain pers- proportion of the population, but there are other things that will need to be done to maximise, as I showed you in that first slide. Only 20% is going to be reached of that vision. You're only going to get 20% of the way to that vision with pure nutrition-specific direct interventions. So there has to be other things going on for that to happen. Um, the enabling environment or the context is absolutely key. So the context can be the social, economic, political, environmental but also the implementation context. Uh, You can think of a very simple program like vitamin A capsules, and just those capsules being handed out through one sector, health system. That simple context, simple program, relatively speaking, although anyone doing that wouldn't say that. But relatively, that is relatively simple. A more complex intervention is latching on a behaviour change component to an agricultural extension program. You've got two sectors involved, you've got two different types of programs with two different types of uh, capacity needed to, uh, and you've got to try and link them together. That is a complex program in a more complex environment. So again, that needs to be taken on board in thinking through um, as part of this, the ingredients of this strategy for scaling up. Drivers and barriers. Uh, certain or, These could be drivers or catalysts or triggers to scaling up. Um, Nutrition champions can be such drivers. Um, there can also be uh, uh, changes in the environment. Changes, for example, the food price spike was actually a driver of, of the focus on nutrition. Barriers may be finances being reallocated out from a sector. Uh, it may be a cultural tradition which is very negative for nutrition, for example, and often those do occur with, with infant feeding, um, but other things as well. Fifth will be this, what's the strategy? What actually are we talking about? And if we look at process and pathways, there are, I would argue, and this is also based on the literature review, it's work that's been done outside of nutrition, you can think of four types of pathways for scaling up. One is quantitative, and that's pushing and making a program have wider coverage. More population covered by that program, that's number one. Number two is functional. And that means, again, the adaptation. This program may start to change, may start to link in with the agriculture sector, so not only health, but agriculture may start to link in with education. School feeding, perhaps, is a link between agriculture. So the the functional change is happening. Uh, The third would be political, moving away from more of a handout mode to more of an empowerment mode um, and generating the bottom-up demand from communities. And then the fourth process, organisational, when, when you see changes in organisations, capacities um, that are required to reach that higher level and, uh, of uh, scale. Capacity, I've talked a bit about that, I won't, uh, I won't re- repeat that, uh, but the, what we talked about earlier still is key for scaling up and it, it's, it's completely ridiculous uh, to talk about scaling up without talking about capacity. Uh, we have to talk about the two together. This is often the elephant in the room that's just sort of assumed will be there or will be somehow uh, appear. Uh, and it, that's not happening. So the capacity needs to be strengthened directly. And, and we need a concerted effort in the nutrition community, I think, to generate what I would call an investment roadmap for capacity. And this will be 10 years, not three to five years of donor cycles, but 10 years of investment in nutrition relevant capacity. Governance, again, we talked a little bit about that earlier, but here there's an interesting way of thinking about scaling up because there's lots of trade-offs and tough decisions to be made. Do you go with the easy part of the population? How do you get to those last 10% who are very remote? It's going to cost a lot more to reach them. So there's the issue of ease of scale-up versus the need. Uh, That's a challenge. Another one is quality against quantity. Um, in, in, uh, in India, they went in the ICDS in the, in the early 90s when I was there, uh, there was a big push for universalizing the ICDS program. And it's just literally tick box. How many districts have this program? Yes, they're all like, okay, now we've got the ICDS covering the country. Quality went out the window. There was no, 
incentives in the system to actually make sure that the Anganwadi workers were actually in place, they were working, they had all the things that I mentioned the Maharashtra finally did, was not there, and surprise, surprise, there was no change in nutrition for the next five years, um, more or less on national level, because ICDS, although it was there, it wasn't actually operational in a real sense. Um, speed, you can go fast, get scale fast, but is it sustainable? So again, that's a balance and a dilemma. Financing, the, the three core issues um, are adequacy, flexibility, and stability of financing for scale up. Um, and then monitoring, evaluation, learning, and accountability, all those things, They're all about making sure that whatever is happening is documented, that there are indicators, they are being tracked, they are uh, being assimilated and, and put into usable formats and the accountability is clear to everybody. So it's not just always up, so information doesn't necessarily always go up, but it can also and should also go down to community-based organisations uh, so they know what's going on. I mean, there's a lot of work on uh, community scorecards in health which have been seen to be effective, effective in improving service provision. Um, there's a lot that's need, needed around there. Um, the final, um, final slide, really, is just to highlight what I think some of the key gaps and issues and challenges that we have still in, in nutrition. And again, we're using this three-level three or three-cell uh, categorization of evidence, so the one, one ev evidence, governance, and capacity in finance. What types of framing narratives and evidence yield attention? We haven't had time to talk about real-time monitoring and the issue of responsiveness. A lot of the problems uh, we have in nutrition relate to data, and the data are old. They may be at a level where it's not actionable. They may be national level, and we need more district-level data that is more frequent and more meaningful and more functional to generate accountability. And so maybe something like using cell phones, smartphones, whatever, real-time monitoring could improve both responsiveness and accountability. Um, Multi-sectoral coordination, strategic coherence. Again, we need to keep the learning and understanding of what's actually happening. All of this has a lens of implementation now, I think. Accountability uh, is absolutely key. The Global Nutrition Report is interesting. It's going to be launched in two months in Rome. Uh, uh, the Global Nutrition Report is, um, is following up on pledges made at a Nutrition for Growth event in in London uh, in 2012 at the Olympics you, and it, it positions itself as an intervention, the report as an intervention for accountability literally keeping holding uh, donors pledges to account for what they said they were going to provide and what actually it's being spent on if it is being spent at all so you know that's high level global but it has not needed at all levels, accountability is absolutely key and civil society is key in, in this area clearly Private sector is a big continuing issue around private sector engagement, and, and again, we were talking at lunch about this. It's, a, it's been a battleground for a long time in nutrition because of the issues of uh, infant feeding that are continuing, and violations of the code of conduct of breast milk substitutes. We need to figure out uh, where the space is for private and public to come together most effectively and meaningfully. The spectrum from nutrition development action is very broad. Not everything has to be focused on the infant uh, feeding issue, but it is a major issue. We have tried to address this within Transform Nutrition by carrying out a, a, a rigorous review of the evidence of the benefits of private sector involvement as far as possible, and actually the evidence is very patchy. We've also come up with certain types of models of public-private partnerships and how they may operate, and we want to hold a meeting next year to take with, with a, a mixed group to take that forward. Uh, I know the Sun also, Sun Movement also working on this area actively. Capacity and finance, um, what types of investment, what type of capacity, how do we do, how do we strengthen capacity? Do we, do we select people and um, train them as leaders or champions? Do, again, probably we need to do at all levels, work at all levels, and do it maybe in a bit more connected, uh, cohesive way than we are at the moment. And then resource mobilization models, I showed you um, early on to some ways of looking at that. One overriding all this, the last thing I just want to say is we have in the last few years uh, learnt a lot in a certain way. We've learned from science, we've learned from, for example, the Lancet, 
we're beginning to learn about real world situations. We've known, we've learned how to generate momentum politically. We've got high level prime ministers, presidents talking about nutrition. What I think we need to do as a counterbalance to that is, is generate learnings from experience. And um, that could be learning by doing at certain levels, but it could be learning by others doing, but to document stories of change in countries. Again, it could be national, it could be district level, whatever level. But actually document these stories, the narratives of how all the obstacles and difficulties are navigated in different contexts. And to, to actually start developing learning platforms or establishing learning hubs or platforms whereby countries can share these experiences. So it's experiential learning and not just scientific learning. And I think we're, we're aiming to move ahead with, with a project that focuses on stories of change uh, next year. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you.